Welcome to the Government Reform Session for the 2013 Solution Summit. I'm Jason Mercier, and I'm based here out of the Tri-Cities, and I want to say you picked the right concurrent session. Government reform is all you need to know. Transportation you can handle another time. This morning we're going to be talking about three reforms to help move the state in the right direction. Sustainable budgeting, so we can get off the boom and bust budget cycle. The importance of open government, and with our Fast Speed Special Session the past uh, few days, we know why that is relevant to today's conversation. And then competitive contracting, using performance-based competitive contracting to help deliver government services in an efficient, effective, and affordable way. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the Moses Lake Chamber of Commerce for co-presenting this morning's panel. And before I turn it over to our panelists, like I mentioned, I am Jason Mercy here out of the Tri-City, so if I haven't had a chance to meet with you, hopefully you'll come by our local offices. And some of the things that we're working on, especially in this next le legislative session, on government reform for open government is to make sure that there is more legislative transparency so that we on the east side of the state have an opportunity to participate in the legislative debate. That includes things by following the five-day rule notice and remote testimony. We're also working very closely on some competitive contracting reform that we'll hear both from our speaker, Senator Baumgartner and Lynn Gilroy. And then on sustainable budgeting, we really would like to see the legislature get to a situation where the budget isn't determined year by year on not whether it's going to be sustainable. So we don't have to wonder year to year if we're going to be facing big tax increases or service cuts. So more predictability in the budget climate. And our first speaker today probably needs no introduction, but I'll, I'll go through one anyway. And that is Ryan Sontag, the former state auditor of the state of Washington. Sontag was first elected to public office in 1978 as Pierce County Clerk working as an administrative officer for the Superior Courts. In 1986, he was elected officer of the Pierce County Auditor. And following his second term, Sontag was elected Washington State Auditor in 1992, where he was reelected every year since 2008, when he received 70% of the vote. And unfortunately for the state of Washington, decided not to run for re-election in 2012, but is with us today to share his insights on the importance of open government. Please join me in welcoming State Auditor Brian Sontag. Well, thank you uh, very much. It's fun to wear a little bit different hat today after 40 years, almost 40 years in elected office. Um, I'm now the, the executive director of the rescue mission in Tacoma. So uh, talk about moving far off from that political realm for so long. Uh, but it is kind of fun to come back and talk about probably to me, and I think the citizens of the state, <clears throat> the most important fundamental issue that there is, and it's not a, a partisan issue. It's not some, should not be some hot divisive uh, policy issue, but that's about keeping government open. Clearly, that's a, that's a very important principle to the citizens of this state. They said so through citizen initiative um, more than 40 years ago, creating our open meetings and uh, open public records laws in this state. Those laws, which since that time have been amended almost 400 times to bring in certain exemptions. Well, these records, uh, you know, they're, they're public and they're important, but we should exempt them for, from public view. And maybe these meetings should be exempted from public view and participation. Well, um, I, think, I think there's an operative word for all this, whether we're talking about public money, public work, public policy, the operative word is public. And, um, it is such an important issue to me that we made it part of our auditing plans and programs. It was our responsibility to audit the books and accounts of every unit of government all across the state of Washington, 2,700 different units of government regularly. And we made sure that one thing we looked at was that if they at least had a policy <laughs> and procedures in place to um, allow for citizen involvement, citizen input, access to meetings and records, and we're, we're at least on the face of it complying with the law. 
And uh, we did that because for the most part, when we found uh, government agencies in compliance and they were being open and accessible, then we found fewer other problems as well. And, uh, and that, worked, that worked really well for us. You know, we want government at all levels to be accountable and transparent. We hear those words all the time. For me, uh, accountability was a pretty easy thing to, to define. I defined accountability as government being open and uh, accessible, responsive, responsible. A government that listens to people and when it talks to them, tells them the truth. Uh, that sounds like a pretty uh, simple uh, prescription. It wasn't so easy for some governments to follow from time to time, and our audits uh, bore that out. I have some wonderful examples of folks who didn't want to be too open and accessible. Um, you know, the Washington Coalition for Open Government and groups like uh, the, the Washington Policy Center are really uh, the folks who remain vigilant in making sure that government's doors remain open. Uh, if we don't have access, just like the, 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 the First Amendment to our, our Constitution talks about freedom of the press, well, freedom of the press doesn't mean anything if the records aren't available. And so at the, at the local level, and, and our citizens put in a really strong um, uh, state law creating these open government statutes uh, because citizens have that right to know. They expect, demand, and deserve absolutely nothing less. Um, I wanted to mention just <clears throat> one recent activity that, that I found a little disturbing to me and, and I think should be to everyone. And that was uh, action by our Washington Supreme Court a couple of weeks ago where they, they said in, in their wisdom of an eight to one vote Wisdom, uh, you didn't see it, but wisdom was in quotes right there, um, <laughs> up, up here. Um, they said that inherently the governor has um, executive privilege over choosing what, what records or documents or information is actually available to the public or that he or she could withhold. And uh, this, was, uh, this was based on a lawsuit filed by the, um, the Freedom Foundation uh, challenging those decisions made by Governor Gregoire in the past. And um, the, the court decided that, yeah, they have executive pri privilege. Nowhere in state law or the state constitution does it mention executive privilege. And I would think that if that were a really big deal to the governor or anybody else, that somewhere in those almost 400 exemptions that I mentioned, um, they would have included executive privilege for the governor's office. Um, they did not. So um, eight to one vote declaring executive privilege. Uh, Justice Jim Johnson was the only dissenter and I thought uh, he wrote a, a very good uh, argument against it. And my opinion is that this would be a great example for the court to say, if, if this is what they believed, and evidently they do, that there should be some executive privilege uh, granted to the governor's office over certain things, and then narrow that and give it to the legislature to craft the policy around it. There would be an open, hopefully open public debate. That doesn't always happen in Olympia either, um, but where citizens could be involved and have access to that debate and weigh in on how they feel about executive privilege or any other aspects of open government. I just, I, I, I've always operated by one guiding principle. It's never wrong to open the doors and let people in. Um, government belongs to the people of the state every day, every way. And uh, those of us who had the opportunity to work for the public should remember that. Thank you very much. <laughs> And hopefully this next coming session, the legislature will have an opportunity, maybe through a constitutional amendment, to address that Supreme Court ruling, as well as some of the other transparency things on their own activities. Our next speaker is my counterpart at the Reason Foundation, Len Gilroy. He gets to do things I only get to think about doing as far as putting these practices into place. Len is the director of government reform at the Reason Foundation. 
a think tank advancing free minds and free markets. He has a diversified background in policy research and implementation with particular emphasis on public-private partnerships, competition, government efficiency, transparency, accountability, and government performance. Gilroy has worked closely with legislators and elected officials in several states and local governments in efforts to design and implement market-based approaches to improve government performance, accountability, and reduce government spending while improving service delivery. He's going to focus on competitive contracting and performance-based uh, contracts, and please join me in welcoming Len Gilroy. Thank you, Jason, um, and thanks to everyone for coming, and thanks to the Washington Policy Center for, uh, for putting on this event. You guys do fantastic work, and it's good to see you. Uh, you know, starting the Solution Summit series, and I hope, it, uh, I hope this one turns out successful and all the future ones that come after this. Uh, so anyway, thank you for, uh, for having me. I'm Len Gilroy at uh, Reason Foundation. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about a pretty complex topic, so I'm going to try to whittle this down into, into just a short overview. I've got a lot of words in my PowerPoint here, so um, I'm not going to be going through all of them, but Jason will be making it available on your website in a few days. So um, I just want to give you a sense of what's happening out there. One, you know, one of the things that people often talk about when governments um, encounter fiscal distress is, well, what about the private sector? Let's get the private sector in there. And oftentimes this is discussed without really knowing how far the private sector can go or what's really happening out there, um, especially at the local level where you know, local governments in one, jurist or one area may not be uh, familiar with some of the advances that are happening elsewhere. And so my job is to sort of watch this space nationally and, and try to summarize you know, what's happening out there, what are the current trends, and, and all of that. So what I want to do is just give you a brief overview of, of this topic called privatization. Um, now, this is a term that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, and you, you hear about this uh, referred to as privatization, sometimes public-private partnerships. What I'll refer to, I'll, I'll shorten that to PPPs. You'll see that in my presentation. Um, also competitive contracting, um, as Jason mentioned. Uh, competitive tendering is a term they've used overseas. All of these are just variations on the same theme, which is just finding some way for governments to partner with the private sector to lower costs, improve service delivery, and really achieve the goals of the public sector. Um, former New York State Governor Mario Cuomo uh, had a quote that I'll paraphrase as saying, it, just because government wants to see something done does, doesn't necessarily mean that it is going to be government's job to do it. Meaning, uh, governments are really starting to um, embrace the power of networks, networked governance, meaning um, again, just because government wants to see something done doesn't mean it has to be public employees delivering that service or undertaking that activity. Governments can partner with the private sector to achieve a lot of different things. And so what I want to do is try to put a, you know, kind of frame this for you and give a little scope to what's happening out there. Um, this can range from very simple things like contracts for who's cutting the grass at City Hall, um, all the way up to big ticket projects like financing and building billion plus dollar infrastructure projects. That's one of the things we're seeing out there in a number of states. You have places like uh, Virginia uh, and Texas and Florida, which have, uh, in each state, you have billions of dollars in privately financed transportation investment underway or open to the public today. And many more states are starting to embrace that sort of thing. And so the, what we call public-private partnerships, PPPs, or privatization really ranges along a spectrum like that. But what it really is all about, ultimately speaking, is um, is uh, embracing the power of competition, bringing the competitive market forces to bear on the public sector, which tends to be monopolistic in nature, meaning um, you don't have much competitive tension in the system if it's just sort of public, uh, the public sector delivering its own services absent any kind of external pressures. And so what, uh, the, what privatization does is brings that competition to bear and adds some tension to the system. So just uh, some of the common goals here, why do governments, uh, are both in the U.S. and around the world, this is nothing unique to the U.S. In fact, I'd say in a lot of areas we're, pretty, we're somewhat behind uh, many places overseas in terms of how to partner the government and the private sector. But there are a few different reasons. Um, cost savings is one. Oftentimes, um, in a well-structured procurement process, uh, the private sector can bring significant cost savings to the table. Um, rule of thumb, if you do this process right, you can tend to save anywhere between, say, 10 to 25 percent on average. Now, that's going to vary depending on what the service is, what kind of quality you're trying to contract for. Um, but that's what we've seen over the years. We've been at this um, business for about uh, over 30 years now. And if you sort of look at the data out there, oftentimes, if you do a, have a well-structured process, 
somewhere in that 10 to 25 percent range is going to be the sweet spot. Um, and that's including a profit, by the way. So if the savings for the government are in the 10 to 25 percent range, that is on that is above and beyond just what the company is making on its own. So that can get in terms of profit. Um, so that can give you a sense of how much the efficiency equation can change once you start harnessing the power of competition. But I would I often advise policymakers get look beyond just the cost savings. That's important. It's important today, certainly because we have uh, the Government Accountability Office in D.C. Uh, that is projected earlier this year that state and local governments are going to be facing a severe mismatch of revenue and expenditures um, through the year 2060. Uh, so we're looking at um, five plus or just uh, just under five decades of um, growing fiscal distress in a lot of places and a lot of types of jurisdictions, uh, and that's something that. Um, Bringing the private sector to bear on the equation uh, is something that can can help to ameliorate that that situation, or at least be part of the solution there in, in terms of making those uh, revenues and expenditures start to match up better. Um, but it, so, but looking beyond that, beyond the cost savings, there's a number of other reasons. Can you contract? Can you use a performance-based contract to get better service quality? Uh, maybe more than you could get in the public sector on its own. Um, bringing innovation, private sector innovation, to bear on the system. Um, enhanced risk management, transferring risks from the public to the private sector. Um, and also accelerating delivery of infrastructure projects and even bringing uh, capital, private capital, to the equation. Um, I'm not going to go through this list, but just to give you a sense of sort of the, uh, the spectrum here, you have the private sector doing things at all levels of government that range from sort of nuts and bolts, back end administrative operations, your vehicle fleet, you know, who's changing the oil and vehicles and that sort of thing, all the way up through IT, administrative support services, and you can start dialing that up in, in scope to, to bigger ticket items, looking at including financing things like higher education facilities, financing transportation infrastructure, and other types of uh, public assets. So to, I'm just going to give you a quick skim of what's some key uh, trends or, or, or things that are happening at the state and local levels. At the state level, a couple of interesting ones uh, in the last couple of years. Um, Illinois and Indiana and New Jersey over the last uh, three years have uh, ended up turning over their lottery operations to private lottery managers who do this thing around the world. You have a number of countries that actually outsource the entire operation of their lotteries. But that's something until, the, until recently in the US, uh, there were interpretations of federal law that that couldn't be done. Uh, these states have figured out sort of a, another way to, to take a bite at that apple. And what they're doing here, just in a nutshell, is in all three of those states, they are contracting with the private sector with the express purpose of getting them on the hook for increasing lottery revenues and having um, some risk mitigation in the contracts to say, if you don't meet your expectations in terms of increased net lottery revenues, revenues to the states, then you're responsible for covering some of that shortfall. Um, so essentially what they're trying to do is improve the, the performance of their lotteries by bringing outside private managers to do things like enhance the sales and marketing teams and, and, and to bring more um, um, expertise to that arena. Um, uh, Ohio, this is a, a completely different type of situation. Uh, Ohio State University uh, was facing declining appropriations to higher education, and they started looking at their asset mix. And they looked at their parking operation and said, hey, we've got you know, a, a valuable operation here. Let's contract that out to a, a private um, uh, parking manager who ended up giving them, over a 50-year deal, a, a long-term lease, giving them $483 million for the privilege of running the, the university's parking system. And the university took that money and put it into their long-term academic endowment as a way to deal with sort of the declining appropriations at the state level. Um, another arena here is the parks. I've written some of this stuff for uh, the Washington Policy Center, too, so you can see more about that in, on their website. But California um, recently became the first state uh, to use whole park concessions. What that means is hiring a private state parks manager to come in and do all the operations and maintenance of the parks to collect the revenue and then to pay the state a portion of that revenue on an annual basis for the privilege of running their parks, turning revenue losing parks into revenue generating assets for the state while preserving the environmental quality and all the sorts of uh, uh, quality considerations that states have with their, their uh, environmental assets. Um, Virginia is a state. Uh, shifting gears uh, it, that has used public-private partnerships to do a number of different types of infrastructure projects over the years, including highways, um, uh, maintenance of their state highways also, uh, modernizing their IT architecture, 
uh, and a number of uh, revamping psychiatric hospitals, really tapping private capital to come in and deliver on some infrastructure issues that they had that they couldn't really afford to do. Um, and then you have Puerto Rico, which has also done some similar deals in the last few years, leasing their toll road, uh, leasing their airport, getting billions of dollars of capital uh, in a, a situation where they're, they were facing really a severe credit crunch and needed to tap some capital, so they leveraged some of their assets. Um, let me shift because I only have a, a couple minutes here left. I'm going to shift to what some of the local governments are doing. Um, Chicago, this is a good example of how privatization, that term people may tend to think of as being sort of a, you know, something coming from the center right of the political spectrum, but this is really, um, it's not. This is not a partisan issue. You have Republicans, Democrats, Bill Clinton actually privatized uh, more than Ronald Reagan. Some people have a hard time believing that, but the data bear it out. Um, Chicago is a good example of this, where you have the current mayor, Rahm Emanuel, um, who has tapped competitive contracting in their recycling services and has actually saved 30% on their recycling by bringing the private sector in to create some competitive tension into their recycling operation. Um, they also have created a billion dollar infrastructure bank to tap private capital to deploy on uh, to deliver public assets in the city of Chicago. Uh, you have Indianapolis, which has been a pioneer of this sort of thing. They've done uh, dozens of competitions between the public and private sector, allowing the private sector to bid on public services, but allowing public employees to also compete in that. And sometimes the private sector wins, and sometimes the public sector wins. Um, but at the, in the end, the taxpayers win because they save money through those competitive processes. Um, they also did a similar type of parking asset lease, like I mentioned with Ohio State University a few years ago. Um, Charlotte's another city that has been doing that kind of competition, public-private competition, for 17 years now. Um, Centennial Colorado is kind of an interesting story where they hired, they did a total outsourcing of their entire public works department about six years ago, where they hired CH2M Hill, a national engineering uh, contracting firm, um, to come in and deliver all of their services in public works, which is something that most cities don't do. Um, and then last, I'll sort of the, say, the grandest example, I'll save this for last. Um, this is Sandy Springs, Georgia, where uh, when they incorporated, they ended up basically outsourcing the entire city government, except for a handful of positions. So today, I think they have about five or six traditional public employees, uh, which are all sort of uh, 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 specified by the state constitution. The rest are all contracted out. Every service from public works to parks maintenance and everything in between is all contracted out. So literally, they show that there is very little that you can't do through public-private competition. So with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up um, and leave some time for the next speakers. Happy to answer any questions on this. And uh, just to, to, to wrap it up, I would just say that this is something that local governments, state governments should be embracing. Um, you have to do the process right. You don't just want to sort of outsource willy-nilly. But if you apply due diligence, uh, you apply good contracting, and you make sure that you're diligent about enforcing and monitoring the contracts, you can um, really tap the private, put the pri private sector to work in the business of serving the public interest. So with that, thank you, and uh, I'll, I'll look forward to your questions. Well, it's a good setup for our next speaker who has experienced writing legislation to focus on competitive contracting and performance contracts. And that is State Senator Michael Baumgartner out of the 6th District in Spokane. He's also going to be able to provide us some valuable insight into the state budget process as Vice Chair of the Senate Ways and Means Committee. In his first year in office, Senator Baumgartner reached across the aisle to write a bipartisan budget and sponsored major legislation concerning regulatory reform and consolidation of state agencies and competitive contracting that former Governor Greg Orr called the most significant transformation of state government in 20 years. And Senator Baumgartner can provide us some insight into what we should expect next, next in the legislative session. So please join me in welcoming Senator Baumgartner. Well, thanks. Let me, uh, let me start by expressing my gratitude to you and the Washington Policy Center for being here. You know, Washington Policy Center continues to be one of the most important entities for better government uh, in this state. And, and thank you all for coming out and being part of the process. I uh, also want to start with an apology uh, to whoever was in the room next to mine last night. Uh, my wife and kids came down. So uh, if you heard the cries from the two-year-old and the one-year-old, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, they're on their way to England uh, with their, uh, Ellie's, Ellie's English, my wife is English, and uh, they're flying out of SeaTac tomorrow, so we made this a family trip on the way out. Um, state budget, uh, interesting, uh, interesting subject in an interesting year. Um, if we can go through the, do I got the, oh, I guess I'm in control here. That's a rarity. Um, first off, the budget took too long this year, uh, but you, you know, for those of us that want us to get it right and want bipartisanship, you should feel good about that part. 
Uh, it's, it's, it's a continual frustration to me that uh, a citizen's legislature takes so much so long, but we have a great advantage here in the state of Washington that they don't have it in DC, which is that we can't print money. So we're forced to make decisions at the end of the day. And uh, we ended up with uh, a fairly centrist uh, bipartisan budget, got record yeses of Republicans and Democrats working together, uh, and one that spent less money than the state is bringing in. And so I think these are things that at the federal level that we, we uh, need to adopt, and that's not the focus of the discussion, but wouldn't it be great if you had a, a balanced budget amendment at the federal level so they are forced to have some of the good budgeting practices that we have here at the state level? Uh, no, here, here. Oh, that's what I had. Um, four big things that we tried to do, and, and there's sort of shades of gray in all these things, and I'm going to talk about some of the things where, where the reality and the rhetoric aren't exactly in alignment, uh, but was to prioritize spending towards education, to live within the state's means, and talk about sustainability. Have a budget that isn't just balanced today, it's balanced tomorrow. And that's a big deal, and it's something that's backed up into the last couple years that we've budgeted on. And one of the big reforms that we passed two years ago, it was a budget a reform led by Senator Kastema, uh, Democrat who stepped down, and, um, and Joe Zarelli, Republican, that used to be our budget lead, which was to have a four-year balanced budget. So the way your state government works, in the odd years, you have a 105-day session that's the start of the budget cycle. Where you're supposed to write the budget, and then in the even year, you're supposed to come back and tweak it in that 60-day special. Uh, but what happens if you only have a two-year budget is what the, the, a lot of the Democrats had had trouble doing was making tough decisions. And so they wanted uh, to do a budget gimmick called the 25th month, where instead of actually writing a balanced budget, you just kick one payment into that 25th month, which you can do one time, but it really leads, it's really fiscally imprudent to do, and it leads to big problems down the road. So when we did the ninth order budget two years ago and the Republicans took over the Senate, part of the reason was, was that Democrats in the Senate had a tough time trying to figure out what to do, and they were gonna go straight to that 25th month gimmick. That gimmick is now eliminated uh, because of the four year requirement. And it hasn't just been Democrats who have tried to do that. Actually, the first person that I know that did it in the state was Republican Dan Evans. And it took the state a long time to recover from that sort of imprudent budgeting. Uh, but four year budget, big deal. And that's one of the reforms that is, is paying, uh, one of the process and reforms that paid benefit to the taxpayers uh, this year. So we prioritized education. Now you see in the last, uh, you heard it Rodney uh, Tom say earlier uh, today that, that non-education spending has been growing at more than twice the rate of education spending. We reversed that this year. Education went up 12%, and we mentioned that states, everything else went up 3%. Well, that's true, but there's a little bit more to the story, which is kind of the big thing that allowed the state budget to be written this year, is that significant funds were taken from the federal government and a lot of costs were shifted to the federal government. So while we did have increasing revenue uh, in general versus what we had in the last year, the state still went out and took an additional roughly $700 million from the feds to balance this budget. And it did it primarily to two, two issues. One, it took about 300, oddly, you know, roughly, these are rough numbers, a million dollars in Medicaid expansion where the, the carrot that was dangled with Obamacare was additional payments, uh, was additional money if you pursued that. Now, the problem with that, of course, is Obamacare is pretty bad policy, but also the federal government is bankrupt. It's on shaky ground. and. Already, despite the shaky ground, the feds have said they're going to walk back that federal money from a 100% match to a 90% match starting in 2019. The other way the, the state found a bunch of federal money was there's a gimmick you can run called hospital safety net, where basically uh, the feds allow themselves, allow states to impose a fee or a tax on their hospitals. The hospitals kick the money back to the state and the general fund, and the feds come back over the top and, and, and then plus everybody up. And of course, the only person that loses is the federal government, and that shouldn't care, mind, mind us because none of us pay federal taxes or have kids that are going to inherit those debts. So, you know, it's a great idea. Uh, but that was really how the state shifted those costs. And going into last session, we were about 23% dependent on the federal government for operational spending. We're now about 25% dependent on the federal government for operational spending at a time that we're running. Uh, you know, we have issues of sequestration, and again, a time there's $17 trillion plus of debt at the federal level. I think that's kind of like banking on Enron, wouldn't be the way I would do it. We did, I did put a measure in this year that we would at least force our state agencies to contingency plan if there was a 5% uh, or a 20% reduction in federal government uh, spending, uh, my bill says, what would you do? That was signed into law uh, as part of our bipartisan process. Now we gotta get the state agencies to follow up on that because you know, I think that day is coming and it'd be prudent to do in any event. Um, you can see education versus all other, uh, 
uh, other spending. Uh, the big win in that, in, in, in my viewpoint, is an area that actually has really seen significant cuts has been higher education spending. That's something that was a core function of government. The state used to spend a lot of money on in the past. The state walked away from that, not because there was enough money, but because it was spending money on other things. This year, because we put enough money in higher ed, we kept state uh, tuition from increasing for the first time in 25 years. And that's been a, was a very, very tough measure to get passed, but we've heard a lot about it from middle income families. Students are sitting on a over a trillion dollars of federal debt. There is a huge federal issue of a debt bubble when it comes to students in colleges because universities have been using student loans to fund other aspects of government. That, that bubble is going to burst and we're all gonna pick, uh, pick up the pieces uh, on that. So higher education has continued to be an important piece of our, our, our and certainly a priority for me in how we budget. Um, what I wanna talk about going forward, what's gonna happen is this balance, budget is balanced for four years with a big caveat, a big asterisk. And the asterisk is the state does not have the money uh, in sight to pay for what's currently known as the McCleary obligations in K through 12 spending. And so three things can't happen. This is the impossible trinity that I talk about in our state budget, which is we can't uh, fulfill all those McCleary obligations and, and increase K through 12 spending to the extent that, uh, that uh, some would like us to, the Supreme Court has said. So you can't do that. At the same time, spending money in the same way on all the other functions of government. And the third thing you can't do all at the same time is not, not increase taxes. Okay, you can't do all three of those things. So either the state in 2015, when we come back into the situation, is either gonna do a major tax increase, significantly cut social services, or take another look at K through 12 spending and, and look at you know, how you balance those things out. Of course, the best way to deal with our budget would be to do more pro-business reforms that help put more money in the kitty to pay for all these things. But you know, Washington State, as we've seen last week, is a great place if you're a big business and you can get the legislature together in, you know, in a day to pass a giant tax break, but it's a darn place, a tough place sometimes for small business to get regulatory relief from, from L&I and uh, from Department of Ecology. So that needs to be part of the mixture, but even if you do that, those three budgetary aspects, and that's really what is gonna be the folks of discussion in, tw in 2015. When, when social service folks come to me and say, by golly, we need a tax increase, I'll say, well, let's have that conversation and talk about this. But don't you think we ought to save money in state government by reforming spending that doesn't need to take place? And they'll kind of nod their heads yes. And I always like to kind of put the onus on them. This state continues to spend a lot of money it doesn't need to spend in aspects that uh, the previous speakers have mentioned. Just think about this, uh, back office IT technology. State spends over a billion dollars incredibly inefficiently in managing state emails, data track, you know, collection, and it's all housed in a building in Olympia, a brand new building in Olympia, that's one of the most expensive built buildings in state history, you know, in the neighborhood of how much it costs to build Safeco Stadium to, to house IT servers. So that's a building that should have never been built at the cost it was built. And that's a building that the private sector in the state of Washington with a lot of technology functions should be housing in a data farm, you know, out in Othello someplace or, you know, or up in, uh, in Quincy. Uh, where that, and, and so those social services folks that say, we want more money, I said, well, why don't you come along and help me with some of the competitive contracting bills that I wanna run? Is it a higher priority to help kids in the poor and help education, which I think it is, or to keep somebody employed managing a data farm in Olympia, you know, in a Taj Mahal building car with marble? So you need to have balance, and, and if you're someone like me that wants to get this and put pri core priorities, I mean, I love the fact that in K through 12 that we funded all take kindergarten up in Spokane. I think that's great. I think it's a core function of government if we can offend it. I love the fact that we help university students, but we to do that sustainably, we're gonna need to do the other side of the equation, which is both more pro-business reforms and also cracking down and using on aspects of state government which aren't core and doing some of the things like Washington Policy Center and, and our other previous speakers have talked about in terms of grading, uh, getting a greater value. So that's a bit on the, on the, uh, the state budget. Uh, the, and here's the kind of the biggest story that you need to take back and think about. The biggest thing that happened in the state last year wasn't our bipartisanship or the MCC, you know, or this McCleary thing. It was the Supreme Court throwing out the two thirds requirement to increase your taxes. And that'll have dramatic implications both in policy and in politics here in the state of Washington. Because I think one of the reasons why Republicans have fared so poorly in this state is kind of the I-5 corridor uh, kind of fiscal conservative social moderate has both been to vote for some of that kind of more liberal stuff and know that his, he's not gonna get taxed because they can always knock it down with the two thirds or with the, uh, at the ballot. Well, that's gone now. 
And so it really is the MCC, which is a, a thin red line between you and $2 billion, uh, at least in taxes that you would have seen last year. And we heard in Ways and Means $37 billion in new tax proposals from uh, Democratic legislators, everything from uh, another push for an income tax to uh, all private property should be taxed, even if you're not active with it. And you will see there is an intent, it's, it's, it's not even really behind the scenes, in 2015, a major new operational tax increase uh, coming your way. And without the, uh, the if, if there's continues to be us and the majority that say, hey, let's do this in balance and look at this first, get our fiscal house in order. You know, I don't think you'll see that tax happen, but I, I do think you'll see a dramatic tax in, uh, implicate, uh, increase if, if some of the, um, the balance of power shifts because those McCleary obligations and what some folks in the state want to do to continue to grow government, we just don't have the money for and we're going to have to prioritize. Uh, so thanks so much and I look forward to your questions. So we do have time for a few questions, but before I do that, I'd just like to offer three little bills for the legislature this next session. Uh, the constitutional amendment on the supermajority, since the voters have said we'd like that for the past 20 years. The constitutional amendment on the people's right to know to overturn the state Supreme Court ruling on executive privilege. And maybe some teeth in legislative rules so Eastern Washington can uh, participate in the process. So three little bills maybe to, to take back to Olympia with you. Jason, can you just tell people that how tough it is to get a constitutional amendment passed, though, even if we all think it's a good idea. So constitutional amendments, unlike in other states, have to originate in the legislature. So a supermajority vote puts it on the ballot, and then the people can approve it or reject it with a simple majority vote. So basically, we're asking the legislature to allow us to put handcuffs on them. So it's a simple task. Yeah. So, so if Frank Chop or Jay Inslee don't want a constitutional amendment, we can't get a constitutional amendment in this state. So even if, if we think it's a great idea. But I will turn it over for questions. Because we are recording for TV, I'm going to repeat it back into the mic and uh yes please my husband's former boss at boeing alan malally used to say in crisis you contact and i sure wish he was still in government he talked about openness thank you alan used to say you can't manage a secret he also used to say the day of the civil briefs not necessarily in a taj mahal freedom ring but <laughs> So to paraphrase the, paraphrase the question, is it true that maintenance of university vehicles have to go through an, uh, a long process to get, a, get the service? And that strikes me again as an example of privatizing basic stuff that companies need to do. I, I'd love to tackle that one quickly, <laughs> um, putting my auditor hat back on. Those, I can't speak to that example specifically, but those are the kinds of examples we would find throughout state government and even even local governments and i guess you just you can't legislate common sense but um i guess if if you could the the volumes might shrink a little bit but uh but that that absolutely makes sense what you're after is is a service and if if you can't provide that service efficiently changing the oil in a vehicle um privatize it I would agree with that. Can I just add on to that? Um, vehicle fleet, as, as you saw, I had that as one of the bullets yeah. on my slide. That's one that um, it's, most citizens have no idea the size of the vehicle fleets that their governments own. <clears throat> and in fact, um, there are a number of states who have, uh, for instance, in Louisiana, uh, one of the things that Governor Jindal has done there uh, a few years ago was to, <clears throat> essentially they looked and they found that they had more state vehicles than I can't remember the, the Fortune 500 company, but it was a major, it was like FedEx or something like that. And they're like, we're the state of Louisiana, why do we have more vehicles than you know, Corporation X? Uh, and so one of the things that they started doing was um, selling off vehicles and then in combination with that contracting out um, some of, now some vehicles you need to keep, some of the heavy equipment, some agencies might need some of that stuff for you know, snow removal or something like that. Although I would argue you can even look at contracting some of that out as well. But um, specifically for the, the personal use, the day use type vehicles and things like that, where um, cities and states own a lot of this, a lot of these vehicles, um, they decided to contract out, and Virginia's done this too, contract out with Enterprise. They ended up getting a contract with Enterprise where they have uh, 
essentially location set up around the state. So if you're a state employee, uh, you need a vehicle and you're out, you know, and you're not in the capital, you're out in another city, you can go and just get a vehicle from that local entity, that local branch of enterprise, they'll deliver it to you, they get a great competitive rate, and end up shedding not only the cost of owning the vehicles, which is costly, but you all the sort of ongoing maintenance. Um, so there are, these are, this is low hanging fruit that just it takes time to go through and figure out what your needs are and then because it's a little bit tricky that um tends these things tend to to get bloated so i wholeheartedly agree with you by the way universities can look at a whole lot of other types of non-educational functions as well texas a and m would be one to take a look at right now because they've just outsourced they've got a big privatization initiative going where they've done bookstores and a number of other different um sort of non-educational non-instructional type of functions so there are definitely examples out there but manzel does not get to drive those cars right, right. okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So the question being, when can we join the rest of the country with a competitive LNI workers' comp? You know, we have one of the most an an antiquated and um, job hampering, um, growth hampering, small business hampering um, workers' compensation and labor and industry uh, systems uh, in the country, and I don't think it's a system that that f suits workers' needs either. You know, you you look at the Washington Policy Center's uh, data and, and as they talk about uh, how long workers are off the uh, the job when they're injured here in comparison to states like Oregon that do have privatized uh, workers' compensation. And so it is a big issue. I wish I could tell you there was better news on that front. You know, we're playing small ball on, on issues that are important, but things like changing a structured settlement ability, for, you know, from... 50 years down to 40 years that would save billions to 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 to, job, to businesses in this state, and we're having an incredibly difficult time advancing that in the legislature. Unfortunately, that you know when the initiative was run in in 2010, you know it lost, and when you lose in a big way at the poll, it set things back you know politically. It's still something that needs to happen. We need to educate the the the, uh, the populace, and the the general public doesn't understand that issue unless you play LNI rates or workers comp rates, you know, and so we need our small businesses to go out and communicate a little bit better too about how they can't hire people because of what's going on with their, their rate increases. And unfortunately, you're very likely to see additional rate increases coming up unless we can, can, can do something for small business uh, in this coming session, which we really need to do. I wish I had a better answer on that. I'll, I'll add just very quickly, <clears throat> and to the lady who asked the first question, thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, but our office, the information to solve these kinds of problems exists, and it exists for policymakers to use, whether that be the legislature or the governor's office. But we actually did performance audits on state agency motor pools, and we did a performance audit um, on uh, l and I and uh, sustainability of those rates. Performance audits should go beyond my desk and into the legislative hearing rooms, so. Yeah. Any other questions for our, our speakers? Yes, sir. What has been the uh, net fiscal impact of the privatization of the liquor that occurred out in Lincoln? So, so the question being, what has been the net fiscal impact of privatizing the state's liquor monopoly? Cost savings and their supposed to be income. What's been the net? Do you have any numbers on that? Well, you may be closer to the numbers than I am, but I mean, it's my understanding that the numbers are, are up. <laughs> Um, what, 100 million or so? I, I mean, this is total ballpark because I don't have the numbers right in front of me. Um, but of course, that was because, as Jason has written um, <coughs> um, extensively, that the taxes were increased at the same time. Um, in terms of, I know that you also sold your liquor warehouse and generated some revenue off that. That's a one time shot. Um, so, I mean, I think the revenue impact has been, it's my understanding, the reporting has shown that, that, that you didn't face any loss of revenue. Uh, but, you know, obviously the, the tax uh, restructuring as a result of the measure, you know, played a big part in that. Yeah, without hard numbers, it has generated more than was estimated. We do have the highest liquor tax in the country, but that didn't change by the initiative. What changed was additions of fees onto the distribution and warehousing. And maybe that's something the legislature would like to address this coming session without it's appropriate, while making sure the local governments still get their share of the revenue they were promised 
which hasn't necessarily been happening the, the past couple budget cycles. We did a performance audit on that as well. And uh, beyond, beyond the profit or loss, is that a core function of government issue, uh, whether alcohol management and distribution or uh, gambling, lottery sales? Are those really core functions of government? Uh, our answer was no. And 33 other states would agree with you that never had that, or 32 other states before Washington never had uh, public sector uh, liquor, wholesale, or retail operations either. Um, so, um, in fact, I grew up in Virginia, which had still has an antiquated, uh, I would call Soviet-style um, liquor operation, <laughs> um, which was, uh, in fact, it was much more restrictive than yours because you, at least before the, the privatization, you still had some contract agent type operations where private entities could sell, you know, on behalf of the state. And Virginia was all state-run and still is. Um, but when I moved out of Virginia, I was shocked that you could actually buy, you know, liquor in a in a grocery store. And it turns out that's what most states, most states never went down the road after prohibition. So um, I, I think you probably shrewdly and smartly got rid of an antiquated model. There are still a number of other states though that still have that and are looking to Washington now to get it right. Uh, places like Pennsylvania, Virginia, um, Utah, uh, these are all states that are seriously watching Washington state right now as a model. We have time for one more question. Any other questions for our speakers? Well, I guess we're so efficient in government reform, we can get out early. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I close in? in uh, I just want to say, you know, the, having run the contracting bill uh, two years ago, which was, uh, you know, this major bill, and one of the reasons that Governor Gregoire calls it uh, the greatest transformation of government in 20 years is because uh, it was originally her bill. Uh, and so she's sort of applauding herself, but it ended up being, I ended up being the prime sponsor and working it through the legislature. But it was interesting after that bill was, was passed, um, how it was a learning process for me and should be a learning process for the public, that even if you get it signed into law, if it depends on uh, the executive branch and the, and the state agencies to enact the bill, it's very, very tough for the legislature to follow up on that and put teeth in the bill actually uh, going forward. And the same interest groups that were opposed to contracting out and tend to be opposed to uh, any reduction in the state workforce for any reason, immediately set to work on that thing after a signed law and did not give up the fight, you know, and continue to claw. And, and, and so it really takes public input uh, to follow up on these issues. Uh, but aside from, the more I'm in the legislature, aside from allocating funds and making laws for the general public, it is really, really tough for the legislative branch to manage the executive branch and have any any follow through on some of these things because there's, uh, even if you think it's watertight or six ways until Sunday, they can get around things or, or read it differently. And so, uh, you know, it bears watching, but to my understanding, we still haven't had uh, a, a contracting out um, uh, advancement in this state that has actually cost an existing state job specifically uh, because it's been contracted out. And also, it's interesting within my own caucus, sometimes you think you find something that you would be pretty ripe for contracting out, and then you start hear, hearing phone calls from people that donate to political campaigns who benefit from the current system and like it just fine uh, as it is. So there's a heck of a lot of sausage that gets made on the contracting out process. I think for the good of the taxpayers, we really got to look at this and really uh, press forward with it uh, on a number of issues. But uh, it, it does get messy on both sides on it. And it is important to remember, there, as business owners, you know there are good contracts and bad contracts. You don't contract the contract. You want performance-based contracts with clear deliverables and penalties for the private vendor not fulfilling their obligations. And that's the interest of the taxpayer as well. I'd like to thank Senator Sontag, and Mr. Lang Gilroy, and Senator Baumgartner for joining us. We will have their presentations on our website later this week in, in full detail. And in just a few moments, we will have the second session beginning. Small business will be in here focusing on right to work. Across the hall will be environmental reform. And I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And please thank again our, our speakers for joining us.